Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. really serving the public the best that we can. Bracing for our state's new reality. Suicide was for her a very real option. The escalating crisis of suicide. They're such a resilient, adaptable, never say die people. Where Louisiana's Spanish heritage comes to life. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Moro. Much more on those stories in a moment, but right now on SWI, we check on some of the other top headlines of the week. A national democratic political group has filed federal lawsuits against Louisiana and two other southern states, alleging that their congressional maps discriminate against black voters. Almost 40 percent of our residents are black, but only one of six U.S. representatives is African American. The lawsuits are backed by an affiliate of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, chaired by former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. The suits claim congressional districts violate the Voting Rights Act and deprive black voters of an equal opportunity to elect candidates of their choice to the U.S. House of Representatives. Another round of brain-eating amoeba has been found in drinking water in Terrebonne Parish, the third time since 2015. The amoeba causes fatal brain swelling and tissue destruction if it enters the nose and sinuses, but it is safe to drink. The Terrebonne Consolidated Water Works District has temporarily switched disinfectants to attempt to kill the organism. Over $2 million in oil royalties that went unclaimed were returned this week through a state program to someone living in North Louisiana. State Treasurer John Schroeder says it's the most cash ever returned to one person through the unclaimed property program. Claims typically fall near $900. This claim resulted from a deceased relative. The Treasury also collects old bank accounts, insurance proceeds, utility deposits, and other funds from businesses when they can't locate the rightful owners. This usually happens if an address is out of date. To see if there's a windfall or a few bucks waiting for you, go online at louisiana.findyourunclaimedproperty.com. Louisiana celebrated its women veterans on Wednesday Governor John Bell Edwards marked the 70th anniversary of the Women's Armed Services Integration Act, which effectively allowed women to serve as permanent regular members of all branches of the military. There are more than 28,000 women veterans from our state. A pair of high-profile suicides within the past 10 days has brought the subject into the headlines, and what we're learning as a nation is troubling. New federal data finds suicide rates have been increasing for years in almost every state and across every demographic line. In Louisiana, suicide rates are up 29 percent since 1999. For this story, I talked with a psychiatrist and with a father whose daughter took her own life. As I thought about the interview, uh, when you called me earlier, um, my prayer was, uh, Meg, uh, this one's for you, darling. Whenever Charles de Gravel speaks of his daughter Meg, his words take the form of a love letter. Her life ended at 37 in suicide, but de Gravel and his wife Angela do not let the ending overshadow all they say she was. We lost our beloved Meg, Margaret McNair de Gravel, in August of 2016. Uh, Andre, it wasn't totally unexpected. Um, she had had uh, bouts of depression and, since, and, and some other issues since she was a little girl. 
Uh, but she was a simply remarkable person with great, great intellect, great energy. Meg was a veterinarian whose practice specialized in horses. Her dad says she was also an adventurer. She was, of all things, a rugby player and a mountain climber. At 17, she climbed Mount Rainier, the highest uh, in the United States, at, at 17 years old. Um, and was just a remarkable person filled with life and energy and laughter. Um, but there was a shadow side in Meg's life as well. And uh, it was a, a form of mental illness uh, that just haunted her. While the majority of suicide-related deaths today are among boys and men, a study published this week by the National Center for Health Statistics finds a steep rise in the number of girls and women taking their own lives. Suicide rates increased by 21 percent for boys and men from 2000 to 2016, but that number is 50 percent for girls and women and 60 percent for women between the ages of 45 and 64. Fashion designer Kate Spade, who committed suicide last week, was 55. There is no exact answer why the staggering increase among girls and women, but experts say excessive stress is a known risk factor for suicide overall. People often commit suicide when they just feel overwhelmed. Dr. Terry LeBourgeois, a psychiatrist with Capital Area Human Services in Baton Rouge, says when a person talks about suicide, that's a red flag, but more subtle warning signs can be just as relevant. Hopelessness uh, is, a, is a, an important um, statement. A person that says in some form that they feel trapped or that they can't escape from something is also something that the literature supports uh, can be a warning sign as well. You, how did that death by suicide impact you and your family? I know that other suicide survivors will understand what I'm saying when, when I tell you it's, it's hard to describe. Um, there's no loss quite like it. Um, you know, losing a child for any reason is uh, 10 on a 10 point scale. I think losing a child by suicide is maybe 12 or 15 on a 10-point scale. Besides author, de Gravel is a teacher, musician, and Episcopal deacon. He had trained as a volunteer at a crisis intervention center. He had the tools to help people, but tragically, he ultimately could not stop his daughter from ending her own life. We had known a long time that when she got into her deepest, darkest places, that suicide was for her a very real option. And did you discuss that? Oh, we did. did. And that was one of the benefits of the training I got, yeah. uh, was uh, wow. you know, when you're helping a friend that's talking about or hinting at suicide, please don't talk around it. Please say, it sounds to me like you're thinking about killing yourself or committing suicide. Uh, and believe me, almost every time that person will be so relieved to be able to talk about it without fear. And, um, and you'll be doing that person a great service. Dr. LeBourgeois says confronting a person you are concerned may harm themselves does not plant the seed of suicide. The biggest thing to, to understand is, is it is acceptable and is okay to ask someone if they ha are having suicidal thoughts. Um, beyond that, not just merely the, the thoughts or the thoughts are, are you having thoughts of killing yourself? In your case, you guys did all the things that the textbooks say to do. I guess if everybody lives long enough, Andre, you realize there are things over which you have no control. This was one of those things for us. We did everything right. She had the best doctor. She had counseling. She herself was a, a person of tremendous will and determination. Uh, and energy. She fought like the Dickens to overcome uh, these issues. And in the end, she couldn't. And in the end, we couldn't for her. And so, ugh, uh. tremendous loss. My heart goes out to anybody who has to go through this. We are people of faith. Uh, we're people of deep faith. And of course, that's been a tremendous asset for us. Um, 
I can't imagine how difficult it would be for someone to face this without a belief in God. One of the feelings that I know uh, suicide survivors have is a sense of helplessness. And people will tell you there was nothing you could do, uh, it's not your fault, on and on and on. And of course, all these things are true, and yet you carry with you the sense that I didn't do enough, I couldn't do enough, um, I wish I had fill in the blank. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a national network of local crisis centers. They provide free and confidential emotional support to people in suicidal crisis or emotional distress 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The number 1-800-273-8255. That fourth special session begins Monday and it will start with a budget few are happy about. It funds health care, but deep cuts would come to all other state departments. You know, cuts to programs like TOPS really grab the headlines. But what about those that hit families or those that keep criminals off the streets? Here to give us some of the cold, hard facts, Secretary Marquina Gardner-Walters, she oversees the Department of Children and Family Services, and Secretary Jimmy Lee Blaw, who heads up the Department of Corrections. Marquina, let me begin with you. What is at stake? A broad range of programs affected here, and it's not just statewide, it's federal funds affected. So let's start with, with what would happen. Absolutely. What the department, the cut the department will have to take is in the food stamp program, the SNAP program. And so we literally will have to terminate that program beginning in January of 19. Terminating food stamps. Yes. We will be the only state in the union that won't run a SNAP program. And we have over 860,000 people that receive food stamps in this state. That's 400,000 households. So that includes children, and the elderly and the disabled. These are the people most in need who need yes. these services. Yes. If you're going to eliminate that, if a disaster strikes, and it will, a hurricane, mm -hmm. tornado, that means no emergency. That's exactly right. You cannot have a disaster food stamp program if you don't have a food stamp program. And so we will lose, and last year, we got $184 million in emergency relief in this state in food. Okay, we'll come back to you in just a second. Department of uh, Corrections, what is the, the main thing you're facing here? Well, Andre, the first thing I think the public needs to understand is that what we've been through over the last eight, 10 years and that we've taken somewhere in the neighborhood of $180 million in cuts over those, those 10 years and lost 1,800 positions. Uh, we've closed four state prisons. Uh, we've closed 16 facilities at the local level, and uh, our prison population is down, which is a good thing. It's down almost 7,000. But to take, right now the cut is roughly 75 million between local housing of offenders and state prisons. Uh, and as most people know, we house 18,000 state offenders at, in our local jails at $24 a day. Uh, so this cut means that what we would have to do, and by statute we have to pay 24.39. So if we try to take this kind of cut at the local level, they would run out of money on, in March. Uh, and, and that would mean sending them back to us. You're talking about releasing prisoners early. That's right. And, not and, because they deserve it, not because they've served their time, putting them back on the streets. That's right. And, and uh, you know, we, we, there's a statute on the books that I can furlough uh, within the last year, uh, nonviolent, non sex offenders. Uh, and what this would mean would be roughly 10,000 offenders that we would have to release over a year's time. You talk about the ripple effects, both of you. Mm -hmm the ripple effects of releasing prisoners, just for example, what are the things that keep you up at night? Well, I mean, you know, anytime you do something like that, uh, anytime you listen to the news or social media, you know, I'm always concerned about is this one of the people that we had to release? And, and uh, this certainly wouldn't be a good thing. And I've heard Sheriff Hilton and, and Rapides talk about the impact on his, his law enforcement if we would release those kinds of numbers back to their community. They just couldn't keep up with it. And our probation and parole division is already overworked. These people would be on parole. Uh, we, would, we would actually release people on probation and parole at the tail end of their sentence, either suspend their sentence or put them on self-reporting to make room for these coming out. 
Uh, so it, it, it would it would be uh, from a resource standpoint it would be disastrous, no question. Mark, what what stresses you as you think about the people impacted, and again the ripple effect, uh, losing federal dollars, mm -hmm. jobs that would go away uh, on many different levels because the program would end. Absolutely. Besides the 4,500 retailers that take the benefit, I don't know what portion of their um, income comes from food stamps, but it's got to be significant for many of them. So you think about the job loss for them. It, the biggest thing is the one, the billion dollars, 1.4 billion dollars that comes into the Louisiana economy because of this pure federal dollars coming in to feed people. So the very idea that in this culture, which is so rich around food and celebration and bringing families together, that we would stop feeding people, mm -hmm. it's, just in, it, it's just unbelievable. What a, a contrast there, not one that you want to have no, happen. Absolutely Did you not. ever foresee being in this position right now, facing another special session, still nothing resolved, and neither side really seeming to come together. You know, I think one of the hardest things for all of us on the cabinet has been that I, all of our agencies have been cut. Secretary LeBlanc talked about what he has lost in the past administration. DCFS lost 2,000 employees and about $400 million in its program. So there's nothing left to cut. We are at bare bones capacity now. Our caseloads are too high. We're not really serving the public the best that we can. So when you get to this level of funding and then they want more cuts, th there is nothing to do but cut deeply into programs that really impact daily lives of Louisiana citizens. You know, when you talk about this sort of thing, it would seem impossible to try and promote the state from a tourism standpoint, who would want to be here? Who would want to come if the basic functions that make something work and protect citizens and clothe and feed them stop working? Yeah, no question. I, you know, I, I think about, and I, I, the other thing I reflect on, and, and what I did talk about a little earlier, was what happened in South Carolina where seven inmates were killed and 17 injured because of lack of resources, because of broken down infrastructure, cell doors not working, because of introduction of contraband. And that, that's where we are. If we, if we go to what we're talking about today, that, that's where we headed. And God knows how much that's, that would cost our state if something like that happened in our state. And, it was, and, and those are the kind of things we're trying to avoid. Okay, reality is we're here. Mm -hmm. Let's try to inject some hope. Do you have hope that things can work out? I mean, you always have hope, but real hope. You know, we've gone through a lot of sessions and it hasn't happened yet, but we were so close in the last vote that I just have to believe that better minds will prevail and that nobody really wants to see this kind of devastation and that we'll get past the politics of this and do what's right for Louisiana. It's not like you have the chance to stand up in front and plead your case, but many agencies could and would be doing that if you had the opportunity, what would you tell? Well, actually, we are, I think we are going to get a chance. Actually, I got a note on on the way here today that uh, they want me in committee Very on good. Tuesday. So I will get an opportunity to talk about some of the things that we're talking about here today and the impact of what this means for us. And it'll be really my second second round on, on right. The, and and uh, I, I'm hoping that what's transpired over the last few months has opened their eyes a little bit on the house side in particular of what the impact is on our agencies and, and that we have gotten, like she says, with to the bone, we're in the marrow here with, mm -hmm. with budget cuts. And, you know, I, from my, you know, personally, I, I just don't think when we're talking about, uh, you know, a half a penny to a third of a penny, the, the impact of that, and I, I think the public wants this. I, I really do believe that. And when you get to Tim Barfields and the Paul Rainwater's coming out talking about, hey, you know, th this needs to be looked at and, and, and we believe this needs to happen, that that to me, that, that's a sign that we're gonna see some good things happen in this special session. That's, I'm hoping, you know, we all are hoping that, that, that uh, you know, that they'll come around and they'll understand what, what we're dealing with here. We appreciate you being here. It's such a serious, sobering topic, and it's, this is reality check. Yes, it is. Yes. Thanks no so question. much. You're welcome. Now something happier. King Felipe VI and Queen Letizia of Spain 
They're in New Orleans this week to celebrate the city's tricentennial. Kelly Spires took a dive into LPB's archives to learn more about the state's connection to Spain. I want to hear this. Andre, our, our Spanish heritage is really right under our noses. Like New Iberia, that's named after the Iberian Peninsula that Spain sits on. Like Charles, named after a Spanish king. Many Cajun last names, Miguez, Romero, Blanco. They're Spanish, not French. And that's because between 1762 and 1800, Louisiana was a Spanish colony. It's a short 40 years in the history of the state, but long enough to make a lasting impression. Spain's influence in Louisiana began long before the land was even a colony. It's a Spaniard who gets the credit for discovering the Mississippi River, Hernando de Soto in 1541. And though Natchitoches was the first town in Louisiana, it was a French outpost meant to deter the Spanish from encroaching from Tejas, the Spanish soon founded Los Adeas, 12 miles away near modern-day Robeline. I am an Adesano. Uh, literally, that's a descendant of the people from, uh, from uh, Adeas that was given uh, them in 1773. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Joseph Gonzalez, in charge of this Presidio in 1734, was actually my grandfather nine generations back. Then in 1762, in a secret treaty, France transferred Louisiana to Spain to avoid losing it as war spoils to Britain. Spain suddenly finds herself with this whole colony. She cedes her Florida territories. The Isle of Orleans um, is all she has left on the East Bank at the end of the French and Indian War. And she takes over all of Louisiana, all of the West Bank of the Mississippi, and France is out of the New World. But Spain had trouble ruling the colony because French culture was already so dominant and newcomers continued to arrive. Louisiana basically remained French, and it remained French because of that tremendous influx of the Acadians that came in from 1765 to 1785. 6,000, which was a lot, a bit, that was a big percentage. Louisiana's first Spanish governor, Don Antonio Ulloa, was not well liked. The New Orleanian aristocracy considered him aloof and unsociable. The colonists were inflamed by his restrictions on free trade. In October of 1768, a drunken mob drove Ulloa from the colony. His replacement, Bloody Alejandro O'Reilly, was swift in retribution. A fleet of 12 Spanish warships arrived carrying an army of 2,000. That was a third of the population of the area at the time. A few years later, Louisiana gave Spain a role to play in the American Revolution. Leading Louisiana into battle was a brash Spanish general named Bernardo de Galvez. Galvez was only 29 when he came to Louisiana, and it was at the time when the American Revolution was going on, and the Spanish had a secret treaty with the Americans to fight the British. Galvez and his men took the English fort at New Richmond, present-day Baton Rouge. From there, he drove British forces out of Louisiana and captured the entire Gulf Coast and Florida. St. Bernard Parish is named after Galvez's patron saint, and it is the home of another important Spanish immigrant group, the Islanos. 2010 settlers from the Spanish Canary Islands off Northwest Africa formed fishing communities that are still around today. With no education, no engineering degrees or anything, they developed boats to fish with. And they improved them and to go along with the environment that they were living in and uh, the seafood industry, the fishing, the hunting. But they, they adapted so well to this land that was so different from where they came. I think that's one of the things I'm proudest of being Islanos because they're such a resilient, adaptable, never-say-die people. Another important group of Spanish settlers came under Colonel Francisco Bulani. They founded a settlement on Bayou Teche and named it New Iberia. During their 40-year rule, the Spanish managed to increase the population of Louisiana by more than five-fold. While most of those coming to the colony were of African or French heritage, others brought a distinctly Spanish character to Louisiana. New Orleans' role as a major commercial center came during the period of Spanish domination at New Orleans, especially during the American Revolution. Language, architecture, Louisiana customs all have their roots in the Spanish period. 
what is today the Vieux Carré, the French Quarter of New Orleans, in its architectural style, really isn't French at all. Most of the colonial buildings in the French Quarter date from the Spanish period and show Spanish styles of architecture. Under Governors Miro and Carondelet, Louisiana undertook ambitious new construction projects, especially in New Orleans. The city was built largely on the generosity of one man, Spanish philanthropist Don Andres Almanester. It was he who rebuilt the St. Louis Cathedral after one of the great fires, and he built the Presbyter, the priest's house, and the Cabildo, which was the city council. And of course, there's the culinary heritage. One of Louisiana's most distinct dishes, jambalaya, is likely derived from the Spanish paella. After the wreckage of the French Revolution, Louisiana changed hands once again, back to France under Napoleon Bonaparte. It was just three weeks after Spain officially handed Louisiana back over to France that the colony became part of America. Fascinating. Kelly, thank you so much. And you can find more history online with LPB's Louisiana Digital Media Archives at ladigitalmedia.org. Summer means a chance to get away, but you don't have to go far. In this edition of Louisiana Postcards, a trip to Lake Bistineau in northwest Louisiana with photographer Rex Q. Fortenberry. And remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows and other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting, with support from viewers like you.